Someone once said, um, we're not on the playground anymore. We're in a war zone. And you know, isn't that weird? We grew up as kids and it's all about playing. That's all we think is, oh, we can get out and play and we get out and do all this fun stuff and just ride our bikes and it's summertime and or during the snow time, you know, man, it's, it's cold out there, but I want to go out and I'm going to sled and I want to, you know, and, and, and all that, all that stuff as, as kids, which it's, it's right and it's good. That's God's plan for us is to enjoy. But then there comes a time when, thank you, grandson. Appreciate that. Then, um, then we grew up and we realized that while we were kids having fun in the snow and summertime, our parents were struggling with stuff. They, uh, they had to go to work, at least some, you know, some dads, that's what they did. In the old days, right, the dads worked and mom took care of the house and that's happening still, but now mom and dad are, you know. So anyways, we found out as we got older that, you know, those, those wonderful Christmas times where it seemed like we were just having a great time, uh, mom and dad were having relationship struggles with family and stuff was happening and we never knew it right as kids we never really knew it maybe some of us did but uh, last week we were talking about advancing the kingdom and we got to see so we're in Acts chapter uh, 11 we got to see um, kind of what it looked like to me waves of people that were coming that were uh, running from persecution, that they were advancing the kingdom as they were going and people's lives were being transformed and they were sharing Jesus as they were going. They knew very little. There, there wasn't much time when persecution broke out um, in Jerusalem, and, but they had the message was Jesus, right? And so uh, even a child can understand it's Jesus, Right? Um, and so they had that message and they were going out and the Holy Spirit was moving. And, and so as they were going out, um, they realized there were uh, uh, people that weren't just Hebrews that needed to know, but they were Hebrews, uh, Greek-speaking Hebrews that needed to know. And so they reached out to them. And, and so then what's recorded in uh, Acts is the first Gentile uh, church was in Antioch. And so uh, people that weren't even Jews were coming to believe. And it was an amazing thing going on. So this advancing of God's kingdom is part of God's plan. Part of God's plan. And so as they went, then the next wave, I call it, was uh, the Barnabas wave, where this man of encouragement came and encouraged this first church. And, and he was a servant, and he had a heart for people. He stuck his neck out for people. He, so here's Barnabas. So that, that came. And then Barnabas went and got Saul, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was educated in, in the scriptures, and he came. And, and, and so he was able to teach for a year there. And so getting founded in God's uh, word and the prophecy that this truly is the Messiah. Um, and so we see these waves are coming in. Finally, a prophet was sent to warn him about a famine coming. And so they, they were able to, um, in advance, uh, gather some money and, and take it down and be ready for that. So advancing the kingdom of God, if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the very final words in the Gospel of Matthew is, Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. And he says, I command you, Go and make disciples. So then it's like, none of us are off the hook. <laughs> we don't come to Jesus and go, I'm sure glad I got my ticket and put it in your pocket. It's like, you mean I'm supposed to do something? And he said, I command. It's, it's a command. It's like, oh, I don't have a choice. Well, really, the Holy Spirit in us says, I don't want a choice. I want to do this. I want to. That's the Holy Spirit that says, the Spirit of Christ in me, the Holy Spirit says, how can I advance the kingdom? What is my part? How do I do that? Um, and so in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Ephesians um, is another place that talks about the body of Christ, that we each are working together um, to advance the kingdom. And... Um, I love uh, objects, but I couldn't get my hands on them, and I'm going to blame the snow. But do you remember years ago, um, there was a, 
a little man that was um, of sticks, and he was on a platform, and strings held him together, a kind of a bungee strings, something like that. But when you when you pushed down on him, all the joints fell apart, and he just crumbled. But when you pulled up, he stood up straight, and you could walk this thing. Do you, okay, kind of a marinade. So, but it was one you could hold in your hand, and it was just the opposite of somebody up here. It was, anyways. I was thinking about that. That the body of Christ is 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 like that. When the Holy Spirit is working in each of us, and we're doing our part, we can actually walk, right? But if 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 not, you know, if we're not all doing our part, the the body of Christ on earth here doesn't look so healthy. Does that kind of make sense? And so what you're doing right now by coming together, you're saying, I want to I worship the Lord and I want to do my part. And so I'm doing my part now, you're doing your part. And during the week, we're shifting gears and we're doing a little bit different part, but it's all about advancing the kingdom of God. That's what he's commanded and he's equipped us. And Peter, it says, he's given, um, he's given his Divine power has given us everything we need for this life, this life and godliness. So one of the biggest ways that we advance the kingdom of God is our lifestyle. Because people always want to know, is that for real? Is what they're saying and they go to church and they do this thing, is that real? Or they just do that thing. And, uh, and, but what's their life really like? So, Advancing the kingdom of God. So we really are at war. Um, Paul reminds us and he says, we do not fight against flesh and blood, um, but our war is against the spiritual forces of wickedness that are around us. The Bible says in John chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, it says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And so we are part of destroying the kingdom of the devil by advancing the kingdom of God. It's, it's not, we're just not protecting ourselves, oh, for that bad uh, world around us. It's, it's, we're boldly advancing the kingdom of God, amen? amen. That through his spirit, we, we're not sitting down waiting, but we're advancing the kingdom. So, um, so as that first church is growing in Acts chapter 11, uh, Barnabas comes and uh, he, he witnesses uh, what's happening there. So turn to Acts chapter 11. And uh, this is when Barnabas comes and then we'll, we'll jump ahead to um, our, our portion we're going to look at today. But it says in verse 23, Acts chapter 11, verse 23. When he came he, uh, he, and had seen the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. Okay, so here was his first church growing, and then it says of Barnabas, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So this church, this hurting church, this scattered church, this persecuted church, as they went, people were coming to the Lord. People were being drawn to the Lord. So let's go to chapter 12 of Acts. So with all this excitement of people coming to faith and they're seeing the love of God, uh, the advancing of the kingdom, there's an attack happening, okay? So what we see uh, here is in verse 12, here is one of the things that the enemy does in the attack and it's through King Herod. So verse uh, chapter 12, verse uh, One through four, let's read that. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some of the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of the unleavened bread So when he arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after the Passover. Okay, so as the uh, church is uh, increasing and advancing, here's an attack that happens back in Jerusalem. 
interesting. So the church is scattered. They're running away. Uh, People have been hurt, put into prison. Uh, Stephen had been uh, uh, stoned to death. They didn't wait to take him before uh, Pilate. They didn't do that. They just, let's stone him. Wow. So stuff was happening. It was a scary time. But I want you to see something. Turn to, uh, keep your finger here, but turn to Acts chapter 8. And just so that you see the background of what, uh, where we are, what's happening. In Acts chapter 8, um, verse, um, verse, uh, let me see, while we were, yeah, verse, uh, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul, who's later we call Paul, Saul was consenting to his death, and that's uh, Stephen or Stephen. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Okay, go back to chapter uh, 12. So the apostles were still in Jerusalem. Um, They weren't running, but uh, a lot of the people were running. So except the apostles stayed there. And guess what happened? So there was an attack by Herod. Who is Herod? King Herod. This is the same King Herod that um, had John the Baptist beheaded. This is the same Herod that uh, stood before, uh, that Jesus stood before him. This, this Herod, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the son, it looks like, of uh, Herod the Great. So this is part of that dynasty of his. Um, so this, this Herod, you know, when, when uh, he was excited when he heard about Jesus, he heard about all the miracles. And so uh, remember Pilate had Jesus and then, and, and Herod came to town and Herod's Herod's jurisdiction was a Galilee, and so he came to town, and he, Pilate heard that Herod was there, and so um, uh, uh, Herod sent for Jesus. So he was excited to talk to Jesus, and he wanted him to perform a miracle for him. And so uh, Herod has Jesus in front of him, and guess what Jesus did? Son of God, son of man, creator of all things, stood before this king, and he said, nothing. Sometimes silence is uh, an amazing, powerful thing. And so he wanted him to do tricks for him. He wanted him to do a miracle. He wanted him to do magic, whatever. And Jesus was silent. And you know what he did? He put a royal robe on him and he mocked him. He mocked the king of kings. I don't think he really understood what he was doing. Um, because later he's going to be surprised what happens to him. So, you know, there may be people in your life that mock you because you're a Christian. Now, sometimes we get persecuted because uh, we do something mean and ugly, and so we deserve somebody to be mean. But for the name of Jesus, because of Jesus, and that's what I wondered. I don't know how many times in my life because I claim the name of Jesus that somebody really persecuted me or said something vile to me. But when people do that to you and to me, and I believe that's going to be happening more and more, um, they don't know what they're messing with or who, who we represent. So, you know, in a way, watch out. <laughs> be careful. Whoever's going to persecute you, be careful. You know, that's why we pray for the persecuted church. We hear stories that what's happening around the world of, of people that, um, because of the name of Christ, I mean, their kids and, are, and their family being tortured and killed. He's worth it. But that's not the end of the story. So when your life is over and mine's, that's not the end of the story. There's eternity and there's a, re- a day of reckoning for those who mock the name of Jesus. So you don't have to be afraid that somebody's not going to, they're going to get their opportunity to come to Christ. But, uh, but the revenge is mine, saith the Lord, not ours. And so it's okay. He's got all that handled. Herod's going to find out that 
he's messing with the wrong person here. So here's this Herod, and he, he does this. And so what does he do? It says in verse 2, so we're in Acts chapter 12, verse 2, that he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So James, and, and he saw that it pleased the Jews. And so he went after Peter. But who is this James, the brother of John? Well, these, these are two brothers that uh, Jesus called to be disciples. They were fishermen, James and John. And uh, they were also nicknamed, do you remember their nickname? Sons of Thunder. Now, I'm not sure why they were called Sons of Thunder, whether their dad had a thundering voice or a thundering attitude, or, or they did but they were called sons of thunder, Um, sons of Zebedee. Um, But look at Luke chapter 9. So keep your finger here. Go to Luke chapter 9, just looking at who these two brothers were, who Jesus named them sons of thunder. Luke chapter 9, um, verse 51. So this gives us an idea of these two brothers. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus. Verse 52. And sent messengers before his face, and as they went, they entered the village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Look at verse 54. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, he said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven to consume them just as Elijah did? And he turned and he rebuked them and he said, do you not know what manner of spirit you are of? For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And he went to another village. Okay, there you are. There's the brothers, sons of thunder. They're going, we'll take care of this for you, Jesus. They're mocking you. Let's just, let's get it done. All right. So this one in chapter 12 of uh, Acts, James, one of the brothers was killed by Herod. Maybe he said too much. (laughs) Maybe... He was not feared for his life, but this is one of the brothers who was killed. Okay, here's the attack against the advancement of the kingdom of God. We know there's going to be attacks that are going to happen. Okay, that's part of war. We know it's going to happen. So how do we respond to the attacks that happen? That's the question of the day. How do we respond to these? We know what our job is to do, but when we get hit with an attack... And you know, that attack from the enemy really is to sidetrack us and keep us from advancing the kingdom. And if you think about the attacks in your life, it could be as easy as uh, uh, somebody says something to you and it ruins your whole day and you've got a, an attitude that stinks and so you're not in any condition to witness the love of Jesus, right? Because your attitude is in the toilet. And so it's like, okay, well, that attack worked, that you took that and you didn't respond right and now you're off course and now you're not advancing the kingdom. So in our lives, there's different things that happen that we allow it to distract us from what we're called to do, okay? So here's something huge. It doesn't say what happened to John, his brother's killed. What happens to John? What does he do, you know? Does it ruin his day? Well, for sure, but what is his response? We don't know for sure. We can, we can think, but we don't know at this point. So, so what, what happens? Uh, James, the uh, uh, brother of John, is killed. Um, but there's something special about these brothers too. I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 9. Matthew, Mark. Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, um, verse, I think we're in verse 2. I want you to see something that's special here. Verse 2. 
Now, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led him up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became shining and exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Verse 7, And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son hear him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Is that, so Peter, James, and John, this special, special group went up on that mountain and he, he was able to see who Jesus really was, the son of God, son of man transfigured Christ. This Peter, James, and John. So James was pretty special in God's plan right there to be a part of that, that God would reveal to to him that. And so uh, James was killed. The attack went on James against the church of God, against the advancement of the kingdom. Uh, And then he goes after Peter, the next one. Kind of the closest to Jesus at that time. Isn't that weird? Isn't that interesting too? And so I was thinking about, really, God loves you just as much as Peter, James, and John. And there are special things that maybe just between you and the Lord. And even if you shared, people wouldn't believe it. So it's something just between you and the Lord that you're, that, you're special. He wants, to, he wants you to know that you're that special. There's something that he has made sure that you understand that you are greatly loved by him and that you're strategic in his plan. Um, in Psalms uh, 116, verse uh, 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints, his people. Precious to God, precious to God at their passing. In Psalm 16, 3, it says, As for the saints who are on the earth, they are the excellent ones, and they are special in his sight. You know, um, God's love is an amazing thing and, and we'll miss it if we're consumed with ourselves. But when we're seeking after him, he said, I will let you find me. Faith is, the, uh, is, a, is an amazing thing, this belief in God that he wants you to know how special you are, but he wants you to seek him with all of your heart. So um, the attack happens. Herod, he kills James, he arrests Peter. So I want you to see what the response is that God wants for us and that is on display in the scriptures today when the attack comes. And so here's how it goes. Back in Acts chapter 12, verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. What? (laughs) What was there trained by the Holy Spirit's response when the attack happened? What was it? It was that the church was called together to pray. 
So the attack happened to James. The attack happened to Peter, which would have been the next day something bad was going to happen to Peter. And what was the response that the Holy Spirit was leading the church to do? And that was to come together and pray. Is that, is that interesting? That is it possible that the most powerful secret weapon that you have is prayer? The most powerful weapon that you have to counterattack the attack of the evil one is meeting with your God, meeting with the, your Savior. But, but something special about a, a church coming together to pray? Now, we in America, are we're taught so much to be independent that oftentimes we say, oh, I can pray, I pray all the time, and I can pray at home. And I'd have to admit that even as I was growing up in my faith, coming together as a, uh, for a prayer time uh, was kind of uncomfortable. But I don't think I understood how important it is and was. So I want to ask you, um, why is corporate prayer so important? Um, just raise your hand if you, why is corporate prayer so important? Is it because Jesus is there to or two or more are gathered? Okay, Yeah. He's with us when we're alone. He says, I'll never leave you. But there's something special about a gathering. Why is that he is in our midst, even right now, his spirit is here. Why is that so important? Yeah, Johnny. Okay. Okay. It's his power, not our power. Okay. But in but in, in the realm of in the heavenly realm, that's where the battle is done. Okay. So we're we when we come together, we're in arms fighting against the powers of darkness. We we've kinda like right now, we've joined arms together right now. Why is that so special, uh different than us praying alone at home in our closet, but we're supposed to do that? Why is corporate prayer so important? Diane. More power. More power, okay. We get to see power happening. And 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 how how is that? It's there's something unique that is special to the Lord when his people come together in prayer. What what, what else? Yeah. Roberta. Okay. We the, we are his body on earth. When Jesus left, he sent his Holy Spirit and Jesus was in a, a human body and that's as far as he could do, go and, and be in that community. And when the Spirit came, it was like little Jesus, Holy Spirit in all of, now we are his body and when we are together, like I was talking earlier, now we're, we're stronger. There's, there's, there's strength in knowing that there's others that have the same faith. So something about corporate prayer or corporate gathering makes us stronger. Doesn't, we're commanded to come together as a church. No, yeah. Church. Yeah, not to forsake our local gatherings. We're commanded. Yes. Yes. Um, like he prayed, the cry of his heart in John 17, you know, like to pray that, that they be one as we are one. That's right. And, and There's something so special about us putting together, uh, uh, putting aside, you know, the different color chairs or what, you know, and meeting together. There's unity. Um, what is it? Psalm 133 that says, um, precious are the, let's look that up. I, 
Precious in the sight of the Lord. Psalm 133. Psalm 133, it only has three verses. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Wow. Powerful. There's something about unity within those that believe in Jesus is a powerful thing. And so why, why, Howard, is corporate prayer so important? So that everyone in the group can be in agreement with what God's will is in any given situation. Okay. Sometimes I might pray in my closet with a certain mindset. And when I pray in corporate, it's like, might pray and I'd be like, oh, that's that's right. It's like when it says, Lord, should we pray fire from heaven? You know, they, to them that sounded great, but Jesus had to correct them. And so corporate prayer really helps us get in tune with what the Holy Spirit's saying. That's right. That's right. So there's something that... Um, It's a gathering, and so there's a lot more involved there um, that's happening. And I wrote down about three, uh, ten things that, yeah, Johnny, one more. Where God also says where there's pure grace. Yeah. 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 Where two or three are gathered, and and that scripture actually has to do also with uh, discipline, that sometimes we're out of line, and so... There, so something special going on here. Um, so here's some things that I wrote down. Faith is on display. First of all, to 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 not watch a program one night and come out and, and you know, um, to what the church did was they gathered and prayed. That looks ridiculous that a bunch of people get together and, and start speaking to this uh, in the air that we can't see this invisible God. So it takes faith for corporate worship to be important. It, it's a faith thing that says, you know, I'm uncomfortable, but I need to, there's something important about this. There are churches that are recorded that are persecuted churches that um, they will travel miles um, and then they will meet in secret just to be together and worship together. And so no one knows they are so that they could just come together. And we just kind of, well, I'll go or I won't, you know. So there's something, but here, uh, I wrote down to encourage one another. Um, in in, in uh, prayer, oftentimes there's songs. Well, there's some people that are gifted with music. There's some people that are gifted with song. So maybe you can't do that so well, but when you come into prayer together, somebody breaks out into a song. They're doing what that part of the body or plays a, 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 an instrument, that part of the body that you can't do, but coming together corporately says, thank you for doing your part because that touched my heart, Right? So song, uh, readings, or somebody that has scripture memorized that stands up and, and quotes scripture. And all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I, was, I, 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 I read that a while back and that just, so coming together, um, uh, what else? Here's one that is such a beautiful one. Um, somebody's testimony. When you hear somebody's testimony, when you come together in prayer and you, heard, you hear about an answered prayer and you go, God is 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 on the throne. God does uh, move. And so when somebody shares testimony, that's happening in a corporate setting. That's in, in a gathering and, and in a prayer time. A prayer is a focus time too. When we come together, we're focused on on calling out to this God that that loves us 
And there's something about being with others that believe that same thing. And so there's an encouragement in the camp to go, yeah, I believe, I believe. Um, A reminder of what's important. Um, uh, Power, faith, and the sovereignty of God. Um, Forgiveness, to see forgiveness happen among brothers and sisters is a powerful thing. So coming together and putting our differences aside... Um, In Psalm 33, uh, David says, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And so there's something so powerful that um, happens that we're going to see that happen right here because there was a group that came together and they prayed and it was a time that God, this was part of the plan too, that God would reveal himself in such a powerful way. So watch what happens. Go back to Acts chapter 12. So in verse 5, it says, Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And so here's the the God God, uh, maneuver. But you know, I, I need to pause here because I was looking at some of the scriptures also that I wrote here is that there's recorded in scripture um, that that God says the battle belongs to the Lord. There's at times when God's people didn't have to take their sword out of the sheath. In Second Chronicles chapter 20, uh, you might want to read that sometimes, but uh, they were going to battle and the Lord says to him, it was during Jehoshaphat's reign, and the prophet says, uh, God says just to stand down because he's going to do the battle for you. And so they sa- he said, go up and, and, and look. And so as they went up, they didn't raise a sword and God had uh, the enemy that was coming against them fight against themselves and they killed each other. No one was alive. And they walked onto the battlefield and there was all, um, they were, there was gold and different things that they had with them. And so they, they were able to, for three days, pick up stuff that they needed. And it was like, God said, Look, the battle's mine. I want you to see my power. So that's our plan when we come together and pray is we want to see the power of God. There's another time when uh, the power of God, when he says, I will be with you and I will fight with you and for you. And so he's with us and we engage in this, in this powerful thing. So um, Zechariah 4, 6 said, not by might nor by power, but my, by my spirit says the Lord. In Ephesians 6.10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. In Exodus 17, Aaron and Hur hold up uh, Moses' hands while the, um, the army uh, fought. When his hands came down, they'd lose the battle. When it went up, uh, they, they won the battle. Uh, to me, that's, that's, a, that's a, an, a symbol or a sign or, uh, of prayer. When the church of God is praying, powerful things can happen. When we're off on our own, that's, that's good. But there's something about us coming together like we are today that is powerful. Powerful. So what happens? The God maneuver happens here. Um, Verse five, or verse six. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping um, the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him and a light shone in the prison He struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him, but he did not know what was was done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. I guess. Verse 10. When they passed the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. 
And they went out and went down the street. And immediately the angel departed from him. And when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and he has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. And then it says, So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. Gathered together praying. Here's an amazing thing. This isn't the first time something like this happened to God's people. Do you remember the first time this happened? Uh, Acts chapter 5. Go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. So it says, when the high priest rose up and all those who were with them, uh, they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in a common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those who were with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel, and they set to the prison, sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found they did not find them in prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors. When we opened them, we found no one inside. Hey, uh, this happened once before. It's all sounding kind of familiar. God's power. But God's people were participating, hoping and expecting this kind of power. And it happened. So the church, the people praying, were surprised. Weren't they? It's like, what? So here... uh, The church was surprised. The people who were praying were surprised. Um, The soldiers would be surprised and Herod surprised. So let's uh, let's finish this off. So, verse 13. We're back in Acts chapter 12, verse 13. Peter knocked at the door. Peter knocked at the door of the gate. A girl named Rhoda came to answer. When she recognized Peter's voice because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was before the gate. And they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it's his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And they opened the door and saw him. They were whatever the word, Right? Astonished, they were, yeah, beside themselves. They were, there's Peter. But motioning to them with his hands to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, go tell these things to James and the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. Okay. This, um, secret weapon, this most powerful weapon, there's something about corporate prayer that is so powerful that powerful things happen. That we believe that God answers prayer. They were surprised. And isn't it amazing sometimes we're surprised when we hear God answers prayer and we go, man, that so shocked me. And it's like, why? We're... We're during wartime right now, and the response that the Bible's teaching us is that when the attack of the enemy happens, corporate prayer needs to happen. Do you know there were times in our nation when the president, president called for everybody to pray? There were serious times, and he said, we need to come together and pray. That's still just as serious today, more than ever, isn't it? So... Um, gathering like this, we always pray. A gathering Tuesday, we pray. 
um, whenever we get together, we make sure that we pray.